Hello, everyone. My name is Alexis Petrie. I work with Sheridan Community Land Trust, and we want to introduce you to Doug Warner for our introduction to caving uh, discovery session with Hole in the Wall Grotto. Um, please note that we are recording this discovery session for later viewing for anyone who missed today. So if you would wish to not be in it, you're all your video cameras are off. So your faces won't be in it, but your names will be just so you are aware. Um, Sheridan Community Land Trust has a few discovery sessions coming up uh, February 20th at the Kendrick Museum. We are having a sledding day. And thankfully for all the snow we got last night, that will actually be happening. It was a little iffy for a few weeks, but that's February 20th from 10 to 12. Um, free, come sled with us and learn about some of the mansion history. Um, on March 11th via Zoom, we are doing a human migration of southeastern Sheridan County with Carrie. Um, that will be at 5.30 p.m. March 11th. You can sign up for that at our website, SheridanCLT.org. And you can find out more upcoming events on our website as well. Um, at the end of this discovery session, I will be sending out a survey. So if everybody could please fill that out before you go back to your day, that would be great, be very helpful. Um, and now over to Sheridan Local and our instructor for today, Doug Warner. Oh, and if you have any questions, you can always type them in chat. We'll have an open dialogue and the chat is at the bottom of the page. And we will start with Doug. All right, thanks, Alexa. Um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, I was introduced as a Sheridan local, and, and I grew up in Sheridan a uh, long time ago, and started caving. Started my caving career in Sheridan in Tongue River Cave. So uh, it's been a long, strange forty years since then, and uh, well worth it uh, for from my perspective from a caving world. So uh, let's see, why should you listen to me? It was 1978, I was 10 years old, a student in Taylor uh, School, uh, elementary school. And most of you don't even know that because it doesn't exist anymore. So uh, that's where I was. And since then, I have been caving in a lot of states in the United States, um, several provinces in Canada, several states in Mexico, over in Croatia, in Europe, India, Malaysia, New Zealand, Australia. As I said, it's, it's been a lifelong passion since I started uh, back when I was 10 in Tongue River Cave. Some notables, I've been almost one mile deep in Croatia in the 12th deepest cave in the world. And that one is very, very vertical. There were, I think three times of about a hundred yards each where I was off rope when I went that deep. Um, you know, I was able to walk for 300 yards uh, in total on that 36 hour caving adventure. Um, I've spent, uh, my personal maximum is a nine continuous days underground. That means I went into the cave and came back out nine days later, uh, which means obviously camping. And I've, I've camped underground for roughly a half year in total. Um, and, you know, in total time, I've been underground for much longer, but that's a half of year of straight up sleeping in a, in a, in, inside of a cave. And I've also surveyed in some of the most complex and longest maze caves in the world. Uh, so I've gone deep, I've gone complex, I've gone large, and uh, I'm happy with all of those options. But what about you? So uh, I'm sure you're here because you have a lot of questions about caving. It's, um, you know, a whole new adventure for most of you. Uh, and it's, it's a everyday consideration for me. So let's see what your interests are and I'll try to address them. Why do you wanna go caving? What should you expect when you go caving? What gear do you need? How do you protect yourself and the cave? Because both of you are fragile. And then I also wanted to just touch on some myths. Um, you know, a lot of people are very concerned about bats in caves. First of all, um, the, this part of the US doesn't have a lot of bats in caves. When we say there's bats in caves, we're talking about 
you know, somewhere in the five to 30 range of bats for the cave. We're, we don't have very many uh, super large roosting sites. And in fact, Tongue River Cave, there are some bats in there near the entrance, but again, it's, it's like tens to maybe 20 uh, bats in there. And when you encounter a bat, just ignore it. They don't want to have anything to do with you. They're afraid of you and they're not going to get in your hair. They try to flee away from you. They don't try to flee towards you. So all of that is truly a myth. Um, other questions I've heard, you've stayed nine days underground. Aren't you worried about going blind from lack of light? Uh, no, you don't go blind staying in the dark. Uh, and in fact, the, the tongue in cheek response I give is because I wear a headlamp on my head. Everywhere I look, it's always light. So uh, it's pretty much a non-issue there. There's also plenty of air. Now, um, there are variations here, but, but basically whenever you go into a cave, you'll feel, you'll feel airflow as the cave breathes naturally with barometric pressure changes. So as the weather changes outside, the cave will respond by either pulling air from the outside in or pushing inside air out. Um, now that's, I said there's some, some exceptions and if you're pushing into a cave passage and the air starts to feel stale, it probably means that cave passage dead ends somewhere in the, in the very near future. And then the other thing I wanna point out specifically about Tongue River Cave is it's a party cave and I have been in the cave before and almost suffocated when coming out because somebody had created a fire in the entrance when the cave was pulling air in. And so to exit the cave, we had to exit through a long, long passage of uh, dense uh, smoke and, and bad air quality. So definitely don't start fires in or around caves. The other one I wanted to address is caving versus spelunking. Uh, the most common term anybody uses to describe uh, what I do is spelunking. And in fact, I would say it's similar to dude versus cowboy or ping pong versus table tennis. There's a few things where the in-group and the out-group for an activity have a slightly different name for it. And so the people who are very serious about, about this hobby call it caving and the general public calls it spelunking. Both are, are equivalent and pretty much uh, they're fine. But if somebody looks at you a little funny, if you say spelunking, it's probably because they're a little bit more serious about it and, and consider themselves cavers. Um, but for the most part, they're fairly interchangeable words with caving as the preferred one. And if you have any other questions or myths, uh, certainly type them into the, to the chat and we can address them later in the questions section. So why would we wanna go caving? Uh, there's a bunch of yeses and nos here. So yes, caving is great exploration. You will go and explore in ways that you've never experienced before on the surface of just hiking around. You, you have a very complex three-dimensional maze system in many cases that, that can be really confusing and navigating and also exciting because you're, you're truly exploring something. And that makes it fun. Uh, you know, obviously that's one of the main, the two main reasons I go in are for exploration and for fun. Um, photos, you know, there's some really neat things in Tongue River Cave and, and you'll see some photos in the rest of this presentation that are from other caves, but there's also one I threw in from Tongue River Cave of the big waterfall because it's a, it's a really neat area. And new experiences, right? So uh, most of you probably have never been caving. So caving is a great opportunity to try something new and see if you like it or don't like it. Um, you, you won't know until you try it. But certainly don't go caving if you're looking, if you're, if you're hunting. And that means hunting in the general sense. That could be hunting for animals. Please don't kill bats or other cave animals. There's no reason to whatsoever. Uh, but you could also, you know, a lot of people might think of hunting for artifacts pottery, uh, arrowheads, that kind of thing. Again, caves are delicate environments. Don't, don't remove anything from caves. And that goes for the minerals as well. And in fact, uh, there are some pretty severe penalties, uh, federal penalties for um, damaging caves. But also don't go for partying, uh, sport climbing. So partying I addressed a little bit, you know, you should not be uh, intoxicated while caving. You should not be uh, going and doing stupid stuff. That's a really dangerous environment if you're intoxicated and you can get hurt quickly. Sport climbing is generally a no. Um, sport climbing is great outside the cave, um, but inside the cave, there's just not enough 
uh, weather changes to, to clean the rock surfaces from the chalk and other things you put on there. So that stuff stays forever once it touches a cave wall. And then vandalism. Uh, if you've ever been to Tongue River Cave, in all honesty, having visited many, many caves in my life, Tongue River Cave is one of the most severely vandalized caves. And it's a, it's a shame because it's a really remarkable cave. So the hole in the wall grotto uh, headed up by Lorraine and, and a few others have been working to reduce the vandalism in Tongue River Cave, trying to remove what's there. And honestly, that's several lifetimes of work unless they get a lot of help. So please come help them remove some of that vandalism. It's, it's just horrible defacing of a very beautiful uh, environmental uh, area. And what should you expect? I love this picture because it epitomizes some of the things people are most scared about with caving. Um, you know, it can be cold. Uh, generally, a cave temperature is the average annual temperature. There are some reasons why that might not be, but generally it's the average annual temperature for the location it's at. And for Tongue River Cave, that means it's, you know, in the 40s. Um, and if you're in there for a while, you're, you're going to get cold because you're touching rock. Uh, there's wet spots, so it's soaking your clothes, and, and that can be uh, an uncomfortable thing. You're going to be dirty, you're crawling through mud and sand and all this other stuff. And again, hard rock, wet surfaces, mud, uh, gets very slippery, and therefore you need to be very certain of your footing, and you don't end up with a twisted ankle or fall and, and break an arm, dislocate a shoulder, that kind of thing. Of course it's dark, everybody knows caves are dark, but it's worth mentioning that uh, you know, if you're in a cave, you need, just like this person, you need to have good light. And a headlamp is a requirement. Uh, you know, as you can see here, this person has one hand forward, one hand back, uh, and is doing some sort of climbing activity. And that would be essentially impossible if they only had light coming from the handheld flashlight. So certainly light uh, on attached to your head is a very important thing sometimes tight, not always. Uh, and so the tightness of a cave is up to you to set your limits for. Um, you know, I've been in many caves where the average passage size is about 50 feet in diameter. Um, and that's, that's big, right? So uh, I often will get claustrophobic in an elevator um, because of the people around me. Whereas if I were in, in, the, in the same spot this person is, I'd be perfectly comfortable. Um, because the tightness of the rock doesn't bother me. But you can also imagine if you're interacting with rock, you're wet, uh, you're dirty, uh, this stuff's going to pull on you, it's going to destroy your gear really quickly. Um, so make sure that you know, you're not taking really expensive gear in there because uh, you know, you'll, you'll tear a nice Gore-Tex coat or you'll damage some really good hiking boots, that kind of thing. Uh, it's also easy to get lost in a lot of caves, and one of the one of the techniques you should use often when caving is to turn around often uh, and and make sure you know what it looks like to exit because it's going to look different than it did when you came in, and that's particularly valuable anytime that there's a noticeable change in the passage. So if you go from a big room to a small constriction or a small constriction to a big room, certainly turn around and take a look to see what's there so that you can remember it for finding your way back out. And I also wanted to emphasize, it's a very fragile ecosystem. And now there are oftentimes animals, there are formations, cave formations, all of that. The animals are in a very resource constrained environment. So they have a very slow metabolism and they grow and age very slowly. Um, so we need to make sure not to hurt them because they're, you know, there could be a cricket that's 40 years old, for instance, and, and that would be a shame to just accidentally stomp it. Um, similarly, most cave formations take hundreds, if not thousands or millions of years to grow, and any damage to them is essentially permanent. So please be very careful of everything you do in a cave. And, you know, I went through all the scary, dangerous stuff first, but really, I love it because it's beautiful, it's unexplored, exhilarating, and unique adventure, right? So there's so many positive reasons to go in as long as you're prepared for all of the other difficult aspects of caving. 
So the first thing to start off with, and I mentioned it earlier, is three sources of light with at least one of those sources of light uh, mounted to your head as a headlamp. And of course, fresh batteries for all three lights. A helmet. Uh, now a climbing style helmet uh, with a chin strap is, is the most important. Uh, a lot of construction hard hats, they don't have the chin strap. And so, uh, you know, if you slip or fall, the helmet can come off and then you can knock your head on something and that's very dangerous. So climbing style helmet with a chin strap, super important. Um, durable clothes again, because it's a very rough and, and uh, abrasive environment. And also non-cotton. And the reason I mentioned non-cotton is because cotton sheds lint that absorbs moisture and absorbs the carbon dioxide that you breathe. And that creates a, a very mild acid that, that degrades formations over time. So if you have the choice of non-cotton over cotton, always pick the non-cotton for that reason. Of course, boots, uh, some sort of durable footwear, uh, gloves, you never wanna touch formations barehanded because the, um, the oils from your hands can impede further future growth of that formation. So we always prefer that you, you don't, first of all, don't touch any formations, but uh, in general wear gloves so that you're not inadvertently uh, relaying oils from your, from your hands onto any part of the cave. But also because again, you're often crawling or uh, climbing on these very rough, wet, cold surfaces. So having hand protection is, is a lot more comfortable. Uh, warm layers, of course, like I said, you're gonna be in for you know an hour to several hours, or in my case, several days. And usually the caves are, a warm cave is gonna be 40s or 50s. Uh, most caves in this area are going to be in the low 40s. Um, so you have to stay warm in that. Uh, food and water, again, just to plan accordingly for your trip with maybe a little extra and more warm layers in the backpack because you don't know what sort of experience you're going to have ahead of time. Uh, maybe you're moving slower, maybe you're moving faster. So having a backpack with food, water, and additional layers is a very helpful thing. And of course, at least two friends, right? So caving alone, uh, caving in general is a very safe activity. Uh, and there are many ways to make it not safe. And one of those ways is to do it alone. Uh, so certainly take friends with you. If somebody gets stuck or hurt or you get lost, it's a lot easier to solve those problems with more people there. So this is the picture I was talking about. This is uh, taken in Tongue River Cave last year. Uh, this is the large waterfall in Tongue River Cave and we were in there doing some surveying. So how do you protect yourself in the cave? Keep in mind, you are fragile. Every one of your bones is softer than any of the rocks you see in the cave. Um, so Tongue River Cave also happens to have one of the highest accident rates in the country. And I'll give you a moment to see if you can figure out why. Um, I'll pause here. But basically the reason why is because people use it as part of cave, honestly, and they, go in, uh, they drink alcohol and they fall over a cliff. They, you know, slip and fall on something that they could have easily navigated while sober. And so, uh, you know, we, we refer to Tongue River Cave very literally as, as one of the most dangerous caves in the country based on the number of, of um, search and rescue call outs. Uh, and that's just unacceptable. There's no reason it should be. There, there's no, um, nothing particularly dangerous. It's a horizontal cave. Um, and it should be a fairly straightforward process, but intoxicated people make silly mistakes. Uh, so slippery rock, lots of climbing. Uh, it's cold, you're easily lost, right? Those are other reasons why you might have issues that you need to protect yourself against. Uh, as you go into any cave, certainly tell somebody where you're going very specifically. Uh, if you end up getting lost or stuck or anything like that, uh, they're not gonna know where to find you if, they, if you say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm going out hiking in Sheridan County. Like, okay, that's a big area and hiking is not caving. So they won't look in the right spots. But also very specifically tell when you're going to be back. And you know, give yourself generally an hour or two of window just in case. Uh, you know, you find something interesting and you want to look at it longer. You don't have somebody 
you know, starting a search party for you while you're just uh, happily looking at something pretty. And then check weather again, uh, less important for a lot of the caves in this area, but still important. Generally, you want to make sure that there's not going to be any severe storms that are going to change water levels or uh, cause any surface issues that, that might uh, have you get out of the cave late or uh, other issues like that. And keep in mind your mistakes may impact future cave access. So you want to make sure that you treat the cave with respect and you leave it in a better state than it was when you got there, which is a really easy thing to do with this cave. There's so much trash in there you can haul out if you just pick it up as you pass by. That's an awesome thing to do to make this a better experience for everybody else. But also, you know, if you um, get hurt, you end up getting a call out for being lost. If you do more vandalism, you damage the gate, any of that, that's going to impact, uh, you know, future access to that cave. So certainly keep that in mind and, and let's keep these caves accessible to everybody. So how do you protect the cave? The cave is fragile. As I just said, it's rocks are stronger than your bones, but still it's very fragile because there's very little environmental change within a cave. They last long, long time. So every time you put a footprint in a cave, unless you put it in a stream in the cave, that footprint is likely to stay there forever. I have been in caves where I've set the first footprint and uh, happened to be by that area, you know, 10 years later, it's still the only footprint, right? So every time you set your foot down, know that that's gonna last forever and be very conscious about that. Formations, I mentioned earlier, they take decades to millennia to grow. So the fastest growing ones are soda straws. They're the very thin ones uh, that look literally like a hollow soda straw. And in uh, Montana, next to where I live, there's uh, Lewis and Clark Caverns. And back in the 30s, they did a, a mining tunnel excavation so they could make a through trip of this tourist cave. And when they were blasting that mining tunnel, it broke some of the formations. And so they have a very uh, clear idea of how long it takes soda straws to grow. And it's on the order of, of millimeters per decade. So you certainly, if you ever see something, keep that in mind that it's gonna take forever for it to be replaced. So treat it with the utmost respect. Wildlife also, as I mentioned, has a slow metabolism and it's easily damaged. And one thing I wanted to call out specifically is white nose syndrome, which is a fungal disease um, or not quite fungal, but it's a, it's a disease on bats uh, where they will grow um, a white fungus on their nose and uh, that's just one of the symptoms, but their whole immune system is compromised. And it started on the East Coast a while ago, a decade or so ago, and has been killing bats by the millions. And it has recently reached the West, uh, Wyoming, South Dakota, and I think Montana now have all positive tests for white nose in various areas. So we wanna make sure not to help white nose syndrome spread anywhere. And if you visit this site, which is whitenosesyndrome.org, you'll see the decontamination procedures, which basically mean wash your clothes when you come out of the cave, wash your boots off. Anything that was in the cave should be washed. And it should be submersed at 131 degrees Fahrenheit for five minutes. And that is hotter than most washing machines go. So certainly pay attention to that. And in general, um, because caves are very isolated ecosystems. There's often microbes or other biota that are in the cave that are very specific to that cave and very sensitive to other species you might bring in accidentally. So anytime you go anywhere between caves, please wash your gear and specifically uh, pay attention to how you can decontaminate it for white nose syndrome. And finally, do not graffiti. Um, I'm so sick of seeing graffiti in that cave. It's been there forever but uh, we should certainly do our best to make sure it doesn't get worse and only gets better. So beyond Tongue River Cave, where I've focused a lot of my effort so far in descriptions is Tongue River Cave, but there's so much more out there. Now, let me just talk about some different cave types. So Tongue River Cave is a cave in limestone, which is a type of rock. Limestone is a fairly, as rocks go, fairly soluble. It dissolves in water over a long period of time. 
And if you have hard water um, at your house, that's because it's the dissolved limestone from your area that's getting into the water. So limestone is probably the most common and well-known cave type, but we also have lava tubes uh, from basalt lava flows. And what happens there is just like the lava being a river, uh, it, it goes through and all the stuff around it hardens and then that river of lava exits and that, that uh, lava tube where the river was flowing is left over and that's a really cool thing. Gypsum caves are very similar to limestone. It's a softer material, uh, generally makes for smaller passages. And of course, there's many more obscure types, marble, granite, talus, etc. If we're going to be talking about limestone, which is one of the most common cave types in this area, and also in general, um, but there's, there's some really interesting ones uh, that formed like this picture in the back. Uh, that's in New Mexico. That's a cave called Lechaguilla Cave. That happens to be the cave I spent nine days uh, duration in and probably where I've camped by far the most out of any of the caves. Um, it's a maze cave that's formed by sulfuric acid, whereas Tongue River Cave was primarily formed by water flow, um, Lechaguilla, Jewel Cave in South Dakota, Wind Cave in South Dakota. They're all um, sulfuric acid formed caves. So uh, they have a little bit different passage style and um, uh, formations that are in there. There's also some really good caves that are much more accessible on the west side of the Bighorn, or west side of the Bighorn Mountains. One of the most famous is the Bighorn Horse Thief Cave System. That's over near Lovell. Um, that's access controlled by uh, two different agencies, but you can get a permit to go in there pretty easily. And it's a really large, interesting cave. So where Tongue River is about a, a mile, mile and a half, maybe as much as two miles once we, once we calculate all the survey numbers, the Bighorn Horse Thief Cave System is over 15 miles. So it's significantly larger and it has some really beautiful formations in it. So I would highly recommend if you are interested in caving after you visit Tongue River Cave, uh, take a trip over and see Bighorn Horse Thief because it's really beautiful and, and wonderful system. There's also Great X Cave, which is near Grable, and many others that are in that area between Lovell and Grable on just the western side of the Bighorns. Uh, Great X Cave is a little bit more of an advanced cave um, water system with some vertical requirements. So uh, keep that in mind. All right, uh, and that brings me to the advanced section of horizontal versus vertical caving. So that's that's me on the right in Lechaguilla Cave. Uh, some of you might notice I said, you know, caves are cold. Well, Lechaguilla Cave is not cold. It's 68 degrees, 100% uh, humidity. Um, so you wear different clothing, but still Lechaguilla is also a very vertical cave. And every time you go in, you're doing miles of rope work, literally. Um, uh, so climbing and descending ropes. So in Tongue River Cave, there's no ropes needed. In Horse Thief Cave, uh, Bighorn Horse Thief is one system, but there's two entrances. Horse Thief Cave is all horizontal cave, but um, Bighorn Cave requires a 90 foot rappel to, to get into. So as you start appreciating some of the, the interesting aspects of caves, you might get interested in learning how to do some vertical caving. And uh, I would recommend if you do get an interest in that, you need to be in touch with one of the grotto members because caving techniques differ dramatically from climbing techniques. They might look similar on the surface because they're both using ropes and some of the similar gear, but in fact, uh, you know, the gear is not as similar as you look at in the, in the first part. Um, the rope is static versus dynamic. The harness has a lower attachment point because you're not taking any lead falls and you need the extra room for uh, ascending the rope um, and a number of other things. So make sure if you do get an interest in vertical caves, keep in mind that the harness, the rope, the rappel device, ascenders and all of that are another step of knowledge and experience you need to have. And that's best gained by, by going to one of the local grottos and, and taking classes from them on how to do that. So where are those grottos? Well, Hole in the Wall Grotto is the one that sponsored this, and I'm a member of Hole in the Wall Grotto. 
Hole in the Wall Grotto represents all of Wyoming. And you have one of the officers uh, there in Sheridan. And it's, um, you know, it's a smaller group because Wyoming is a smaller population state and there's not a lot of, you know, proportion wise, there's not a lot of cavers in the population in general. So when you have a smaller population like Wyoming, you have smaller grottos. Northern Rocky Mountain Grotto is the one uh, here in Montana where I live. Uh, I'm also a member of that. In fact, I'm one of the founding members of that. Uh, and we cover uh, a wide range as well. So not only do we cover all of Montana, but we also have members reaching into South Dakota, down into Wyoming, uh, Idaho, and up into Canada, and then a few others spread around the country. Pahasapa Grotto is in South Dakota in the Rapid City area with their large density caves in the Black Hills. They're, they're active all the time and great people there uh, also remember that. And if you're looking at the larger picture, uh, we have a nationwide group called the National Speleological Society. And that's uh, what all of these first three grottos are affiliated with. So uh, certainly keep that as an option if you're looking for more information and wanting to support caving in general. And then this last one I threw on there, Derek Bristol is a friend of mine, and he has a great website, including a whole bunch of YouTube videos he spent the last several years developing, which help people getting started in caving, um, learning gear, learning the techniques, and a lot of the reasons. So his website would be a great follow on to get more information after this presentation, if you're looking just to explore a little bit yourself before you reach out to any of these other organizations. And so that brings us to the questions and stories. Let me see if I can, I don't have my, uh, uh, let's see, I don't have my questions area up here. Let me see if I can find it. Maybe controls, there it is. Um, huh, not seeing it. Well, I guess, um, Lexus, if you can read some of those off to me, I'm not able to find the, the chat window. Wait a minute. I don't have any questions so far, but if anybody has questions, if you go down to the bottom of your screen, there's a chat bubble. If you click on that, you can type in your questions there. Thank you. Yeah, I'm. <laughs> All right, we have one question. Are guided trips offered? So um, there are no guided trips to uh, what we generally refer to as, uh, you know, uh, wild caves. But there are some around the area. If you go to uh, Jewel Cave or Wind Cave in South Dakota, those are National Park and, and uh, National Monument Caves, and they have regular guided tours. And also here in Montana, um, probably about a five hour drive from Sheridan is Lewis and Clark Caverns, and that's a state park. And all of those have guided cave trips, and that would be a great part, a great opportunity if you're uncertain if it's something you like and don't want to jump in on a wild cave without a, without a uh, tour guide. Austin asks, have you been to the second entrance in Tongue River Canyon? And if so, do they connect? The second entrance. Um, so there's a nearby cave uh, that is a different cave than Tongue River Cave. So no, they don't connect. As far as we know at this point, there is water coming into the cave, but there's no viable passage uh, to have another entrance except for the main one that everybody knows about. Um, theoretically, where the water comes in should have an entrance, but it's certainly at this point undiscovered and not passable. I have a question. What has been your favorite international cave to go into? My favorite international cave. So this one that's shown here, I'll talk about a couple of them. Um, this one that's shown here is uh, Cheve Cave and that's the shirt that I'm wearing from 2019. Um, 
that one was really interesting because uh, you know it's a it's the second deepest cave in the Western Hemisphere, and it's it's large and super long. And so this picture is from Camp One in the cave. Uh, there are five camps in the cave, each progressing deeper and deeper and deeper. So uh, that one was really interesting because. Uh, you know, it's not particularly lots of beautiful formations, but it's an interesting, complex, large cave system. Um, the one in Croatia was also fascinating to me because it's so vertical. Um, if you want to look it up, it's called uh, Lukina Yama, L-U-K-I-N-A space J-A-M-A, and there's some good uh, maps of it on online, but it's massively vertical. In fact, it's considered the most vertical cave system in the world. So as I mentioned, um, you know, we, we went, I went there, uh, we went uh, almost a mile deep, but I was only off rope three times and each time was about a hundred yards of walking before I got onto the next rope. And that cave was honestly the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, so it was interesting for that. Uh, it's always interesting when you find your limits. Uh, and that one, it was uh, 36 hours of being awake uh, before we got to sleep because you just have so much vertical work and waterfalls and nowhere to lay down. Um, the cave itself is right around freezing. So super complicated uh, logistically for that cave. We had an expedition, the whole expedition there was about 40 people. And that was to get two divers to the bottom of the cave to push the sump at the bottom. The sump is just where the, the cave hits the water table basically. So we had 40 people uh, in multiple shifts that started off rigging the cave to the bottom and then coming back up to the camp area. So the, the bottom of the cave is about 1400 meters deep. Uh, the camp area is about a thousand meters deep. So they had to rig all the way down and come back up to the camp area before the group I was in, we were carrying uh, dive tanks, each about 40 pounds of gear as we were going down. So we then followed the people who rigged the cave all the way down. Um, they had to come up from that last 400 meters to get to the, to the camp area before, so we could pass them to go the rest of the way down. Um, we waited for the divers to set up, then we exited. And by the time we got to all the way to the bottom and then back up to where we could sleep. It was uh, 36 hours of just climbing ropes uh, with a 40 pound bag of gear. Um, then when we got there, I was so exhausted. They put uh, four of us in a four person tent where we slept on yoga mats with two sleeping bags zipped together as a blanket at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. No pillows, no nothing. And uh, they had to wake us up 17 hours later because we were so exhausted we slept that hard. Um, and then we spent another 12 hours climbing out. So that one was really interesting because of just the logistical complexity and the sheer physical effort required. And then if you wanna go fun, uh, so rather than scaring you guys with all those, my international, most fun international trip probably was a guided trip in New Zealand. Uh, they call it um, dark water rafting or something like that. You ride inner tubes through a cave and look at glow worms. It's, it was just stunningly fun and highly recommended if you ever get a chance. That does sound fun. Um, so we have a few more questions. What is the average time of a tr trip in a cave? You know, that, that depends on who is in there and who, what you're trying to accomplish. So let me first zero in on something like Tongue River Cave. I would say if you're just going in for your own fun and enjoyment, the average trip is probably going to be about three to four hours. Um, could be less if you are newer to caving or, you know, don't have a lot of gear or any of that. So you might do shorter hour long trips or something like that. But I would say if you wanted to, if you, most people will say, I'm going to go either to the, the long end of the branch of the cave or the shorter branch end of the cave. And if, you're, if your goal is to go to the end and then come back out, I'd say generally like three to four hours is most common there. Other caves uh, have other 
expected times. And, and as I mentioned, I've spent nine days in Lechuguia Cave before. Lechuguia Cave has very tightly controlled access. It's in Carlsbad Caverns National Park, but because of the complexity and difficulty of the cave, um, you have to you have to be uh, one of the, the few people in the country that is qualified to go in. And then once that once you pass that bar, then you have to have a valid work project. And so that has to get approved by the Park Service. And when all of that's said and done, uh, on an average year, Lechigia Cave is going to have about 100 people per year visit it in total. Now that cave, anytime you go in, the average time you're in is eight days. Uh, and that means some people come out in seven, uh, most people stay in eight, and there are rare occasions, uh, like a unique situation I had where it was nine days. So that unique nine day situation was we had planned on going in for eight days, but just before we entered the cave, um, in our group of four people, uh, one of them had a family health emergency. And so he had to exit the cave midway through the expedition to check messages and that kind of thing. So that gave us in the cave an extra day to do work. Um, and they brought us in the extra day of food, which is pretty fun. So yeah, it can be any range. And in that Cheve cave, you know, uh, the one in Mexico that I'm wearing the shirt from, um, I camped five days in that cave, uh, but saying an average there is really difficult because some people only go in for shorter periods of time, like one to three days. But there are some people who will go in and just have food uh, carried in for them and they'll stay in, you know, four to six weeks underground. A long time. It is. Um, someone said last I knew TRC was closed to protect the bats. Do we know if that's still ongoing? So I think uh, maybe somebody else uh, has better knowledge of that, uh, maybe Lorraine or somebody. But yes, Tongue River Cave has periodically closed because there are bats that hibernate there. As I said, you know, our caves in this region of the country don't have a lot of bats, usually. Um, Tongue River Cave is, is on the order of 20-ish bats, uh, maybe as many as 50 bats during the hibernation season. So we want to be really careful not to interrupt bats during hibernation because it's a huge energy drain for them. Uh, they're living through uh, the winter on just their fat stores. And when you're talking about an animal that weighs a few grams at most, those, are, you know, just waking up at the wrong time can kill a bat during hibernation. So that's made extra salient uh, in the era of white nose and uh, you know they need everything they can to make it to the next season. Excuse me. <clears throat> they need everything they can to make it to the next season to overcome their illness. And so yes, oftentimes anywhere that's been identified as having hibernating bats will close for certain parts of the season. And so check with the forest service who controls permits and access make sure you have proper permits and access to go into the cave and they will let you know what the actual season is. Uh, confirm that it is currently closed. So um, the next question is, are the caves near Thermopolis safe? Um, you know, safe, I always say tongue in cheek, right? Uh, they can be as dangerous as Tongue River Cave if you're uh, drunk and under equipped but most caves are safe. I think the safe that you're referring to is probably uh, the air quality. And most caves are fine with air. Uh, but again, when you get to thermal areas, there are potential uh, situations where there's a high concentration of hydrogen sulfide gas. And then also in some um, highly vegetated areas, there are chances of um, you know, methane or high carbon monoxide levels as the, as the vegetation decomposes. So I would say in general, most caves are fine, but certainly uh, talk to a local. Now, uh, something as general as the caves in, in um, Thermopolis area, you know, most of them are gonna be fine, but you know, it's, it's hard to specify which one might be avoided. And I think Lorraine, who has family in Tongue River, or sorry, Tongue River, in Thermopolis area, uh, 
And so she's explored a lot of those near her hometown. She might have some specific guidance there. This question is, have you ever found yourself lost in a cave? And if so, do you have tips for finding your way again? That's a great question. And, you know, oftentimes when people hear that I have done a lot of cave exploring, uh, they'll, they'll follow on and say, oh, are you a cave diver? And one of my, you know, tongue in cheek responses is, no, I'm not a cave diver because I'm not suicidal. But what I mean behind that gets to answering your question. So um, it's reasonably common, even for somebody with my experience, to get turned around in a cave. You know, lost is, is quite an exaggeration, but turned around meaning, wow, how do I, how did I get here and how do I get back? And I might spend anywhere from 30 seconds to 15 minutes um, trying to find my way back for whatever reason. And that's why I say, you know, the, when you're dry caving, um, your only concern is running out of light, food and water. If you're scuba diving, um, you know, you can run out of air as well. And if I get turned around on a regular basis for 15 minutes at a time, sometimes, that can be the difference between life and death when scuba diving. So, uh, you know, to answer your question, yes, I get turned around regularly, uh, confused about the direction to go, and that's normal and it's expected. So don't freak out if that happens to you because you should be developing the skills to find your way back in those situations. And, and I mentioned one of those key ones uh, during the presentation, anytime, uh, as often as you can, but certainly any time that the passage characteristics change, stop, turn around and memorize what it looks like as you would be coming out. And that's gonna be a key, uh, most important trick for making sure that you're not going to have a true lost experience and instead have something like I do, which is, yeah, I occasionally get turned around. Um, the next one is to recognize the fact that, as I mentioned, anytime you set a footprint in the cave, that's going to be there forever. And in less traveled areas, it's really easy to identify where you've gone before, where the trails are. And then certainly in heavier traveled areas like Tongue River Cave, for most of that entrance series, people have been everywhere, but you can still see what we refer to as the elephant trails, the areas that are impacted even more, and you can follow those. What doesn't work in general is, uh, you know, paying any attention to the graffiti on the walls. You'll have arrows that are pointing in opposite directions and both saying out. And, you know, that just emphasizes the unreliable aspect of, of any of that graffiti. Um, the other thing is, you know, any sort of markers you leave generally are, are first of all trash and please don't leave any markers anywhere. But second of all, they're easy to miss um, and easy to forget. So, um, you know, leaving markers are, are not very good uh, methods for, for uh, helping you to avoid being lost. So I would say that the two top ones are looking behind you on a regular basis and then also paying attention to where the elephant trails are, where pe many people have traveled before and going from that. Our next question is, what kind of resources would you recommend? Info about rigs, maps, and such. So the best resource are the grottos that I mentioned. So, uh, so that'd be the Hole in the Wall Grotto, which is local to Wyoming area. That'd be the Northern Rocky Mountain Grotto, which handles just north of where you are. And that would be uh, Pahasapa, which is uh, kind of east of where you guys are. And the reason why I say that is because those are the people who know all, where all of your local caves are and uh, have all the information on them. In many cases, they're the people who mapped those caves. So they know all the details about the caves. And that's really your best option to go to a cave area that you've never been to before. It's generally hard to find cave maps. And I say generally hard because um, cavers recognize the fragile nature of caves and the the problems with impact. And so they generally don't want to publish information to the general public 
and risk a resource getting closed because it was damaged. Um, so if you go to any of the grottos, they're going to welcome you in and take you on a few training trips. And then once you, uh, it, once it's clear to them, you know how to handle yourself in a cave, then, then you know, they open up the libraries and say, here's all of the information for locations and maps that you would need uh, for going to, to these caves on your own. I have another question, and I'm sorry about my pronunciation on this one. Recently, I read a news article about Lechuga Caverns. Lechuga. It was Lechuga Caverns. It was about a pool untouched by humans. Is this something you've heard of? And if so, have you seen it? Yes and yes. <laughs> so Lechuga Cave, um, nobody's asked this yet, but it's my favorite cave. Um, it's my favorite cave because it's so stunningly beautiful and pristine. So, you know, like I said, there's a hundred people per year that go into it now. The total unique individuals who've been in that cave is probably a thousand-ish, um, you know, in, in the entire time since 1987 that, that it was dug open. So it's, it's just remarkably pristine and beautiful. Um, and I go there every chance I get. I've done at least 20 expeditions in there of eight days each uh, on average. And I've been to all the major branches in the cave. And in fact, the, the map that you see right, right there, that is a map of Never Never Land in Lechuguia Cave that uh, we discovered a few years ago. Uh, I think it was 2016, we were in there mapping that. And so it's very common in that cave to encounter areas nobody's ever been to before. Uh, that article that you're talking about was from a friend of mine or about a friend of mine, Hazel Barton. Um, she's a remarkable person as a microbiologist. She's a professor in microbiology and has kind of created the, the study of cave microbes um, and, and is kind of the, the world leading expert on cave microbes. And Lechuguia is an amazing environment for that because humans really have had almost no impact at all on that cave. There, like I said, there have been a thousand-ish people in that cave ever in the entire history of that cave. And early on, it was recognized the value of that pristine nature. And so the Park Service put in requirements that as you're surveying, if you encounter a body of water, you never cross that body of water you always try to find a way around it because many of the microbes are living in isolated communities in that water and they can use that, uh, they can go and sample that for, for microbes. And in fact, uh, Hazel has sampled uh, microbes out of Lechuguia Cave and discovered some really interesting things that are leading to new antibiotics and other things like that. So one of the, one of the really cool things that, was dis that she discovered in Lechuguia Cave is that there are microbes that have existed untouched for millennia in that cave. You know, there's, there's been no outside influence. There's, you know, clearly no antibiotics have ever gotten there. And these microbes have full antibiotic resistance. And that kind of blew the minds of all of the, and, uh, uh, all of the researchers in that area. And it allowed them to, to take a step back and study what is it about these microbes that makes them antibiotic resistant? And they discovered some unique uh, cellular processes in these microbes that, uh, that are helping them design new antibiotics that are more broad spectrum that uh, impact even those other microbes that are antibiotic resistant. So yes, I have heard about it. Uh, I know the people involved and I have seen that particular pool in that particular area. That's all the questions I've gotten so far, so. All right. Um, let's see, I can tell a few more stories if people are interested. Um, back in high school, when I was going to Tongue River Cave regularly, um, it was the only cave I knew. And so I would go there every chance I got. And, you know, recently I tried to count the number of times I've been in there and I lost count at 50. So I've been all over that cave. And in high school one time, I went with a bunch of friends. We did everything right. We had all the right gear. We told people where we were going, but there was one miscommunication on, um, 
the time out. And we, you know, four out of the five of us on the trip had notified people will be out at, I forget the time, it was like 11 p.m., something like that. But one of them told, told the parents, yeah, we'll be back home by nine. So when they weren't home at nine, uh, they called out a rescue on us. And we came out of the cave on our predicted schedule. It was beautiful. We came out, the, it was dark. It was a full moon lighting up all of Tongue River ca Canyon. And then there was a spotlight searching the canyon. It's like, what's, what's going on with that? And we eventually hiked down and, and found out, you know, the, the reason was uh, one of us had given a, a too early out time that wasn't coordinated with the others. And so their parents sent the, the sheriff in and the sheriff was looking for us and just making sure that we were safe, which is great. But the funny part about that story is uh, the sheriff turned to us and said, why would anybody want to do this at night? And that's particularly humorous because it's always night inside of a cave. It doesn't make a difference if I'm caving at 3 a.m. or 3 p.m. It's the same. So uh, caves are unchanging in all ways, and it's, it's not, uh, not something that's commonly recognized. Uh, let's see, what other fun, interesting trips. Uh, vertical caving, one of the funny things that can happen is uh, if you're rappelling, we generally use different devices than most rock climbers would use. We use most commonly a, a rack in the U.S., which is a, it's a big U-shaped device with crossbars, and you, you weave the rope through those crossbars, and that helps you go in, in very good control. It lets you descend the ropes, and if anybody has long hair or a long beard, uh, it's not uncommon that you might get your hair caught in there, and that is not at all fun for the person who that happens to, but uh, depending on the situation can be funny for their friends who are watching. Um, there was one of those in New Mexico that, that I encountered. A good friend of mine got literally two inches from the bottom and got his hair caught in the rack and he was stretching as hard as he could to try to reach the bottom to, to take the pressure off of his hair. And we eventually just rushed over and, and quickly cut his hair and it wasn't a problem, but it was pretty funny to watch. So I got another interesting question. Um, yeah. When you stay the night or extended period in a cave, what do you do with human waste? Mm. Do you use bags or pack out? That is a great question. And so I forgot to mention this in the gear that you take. Um, I did mention caves are very sensitive environments. And so uh, it's generally frowned upon to leave any human waste in the cave, and that includes urine. So it's uh, preferred and strongly recommended to carry a bottle uh, to collect urine so you can dump that outside the cave. Uh, the solid waste is also uh, impactful, uh, even potentially more impactful to the cave. So when you're camping in the cave, uh, yes, usually we use uh, bags. I, I prefer wag bag, which is just a common camping uh, supply bag. Uh, and so what we do in something like Lechuguilla when we're in there for many days at a time, uh, we have a bathroom area. And so uh, during the day when you're out uh, exploring and mapping the cave, you carry bottles for urine um, and then in the mornings before or evenings after uh, you collect, you, you dump the urine in the, in the bathroom area into larger collectors. Uh, and, and in fact, you know, we use wine bladders and, and, you know, five liter wine bladder type things. And then the solid waste, uh, we also have the, the wag bags or similar setups to that. Um, and then because urine isn't quite so impactful and it's super heavy, we, do dump the urine in those camping caves in a very uh, isolated area. That's not always, that's in Lechia. In other caves like Jewel Cave, the, the camping duration limit is based off of how much urine you can carry out because they don't allow urine dumping in that cave. But in all caves, it's carry out the solid waste. But it also makes camping a little bit tricky because uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the leave no trace ethic beyond what anybody who hikes has a concept of. So uh, we use dehydrated meals because you can't wash dishes, for instance. So you have one dish to boil water and then you dump it in your dehydrated food and you let it soak and you eat it. You can't actually 
cook food in the cave, you have to just heat the water and then let the water hydrate the food. So you don't end up with the dirty dishes. Similarly, you know, you're in the cave, you still do your normal activities. So you have to brush your teeth. And that means you can't spit in the cave, right? So either uh, you do what I do, which is use just a very small amount of toothpaste and swallow it afterwards. Or some people will have a small garbage bag that they'll spit the toothpaste into. But that should emphasize the level of, of zero impact that people who do this regularly try to achieve. Um, you'll also see in this photo that's on the screen, the tarps that we camp on. In Lechigia Cave, um, part of the rules include, you have to carefully fold up that tarp and pack out anything that's on there, which includes any rocks that fell onto it uh, or any sand that's on there, just because there's other human hair and skin cells and maybe crumbs that you dropped while eating. And we don't wanna leave those in the cave. So we are very thoughtful and, and pay close attention anytime we're eating in the cave to not drop any crumb because that crumb will mold, it will create other problems for that environment. Um, but we also are doing that level of, of management with the human waste as well. And that was interesting to learn about. All right, do we have any more questions? I'll ask one more maybe. See if anybody types anything in. All right, Doug, I think we're all out of questions for you. All right. Well, thanks for having me. And I hope this was informative for people. And if you are interested in uh, doing some caving, uh, certainly reach out to the Forest Service before you go into Ten River Cave to make sure it's open and you have the right permits. And if you uh, really enjoy the caving process and the activities, reach out to either Hole in the Wall Grotto or uh, Northern Rocky Mountain Grotto, which are the two that are most likely to cover areas you're likely to go caving in. We overlap a lot. And in fact, I think most people in Hole in the Wall Grotto are members of the Northern Rocky Mountain Grotto. And many of us in the Northern Rocky Mountain Grotto are members in the Hole in the Wall Grotto. So um, we do trips from the Northern Rocky Mountain Grotto into Wyoming all the time and oftentimes uh, joint trips with the Hole in the Wall Grotto. So please reach out to us. They're the best, the, those two grottos are gonna be the best resource you'll ever get for local caving. All right. Thank you, Doug. This was a great Zoom session and you're getting tons of thank yous in the chat box as well. So yes, very much appreciate it. I can't find that chat box, but. I'm, it's all right. <laughs> it was probably good to read out the questions as well. So if somebody else couldn't find it, they could hear it. Um, yes. All right. And everyone, please visit the Sheridan, Commu Sheridan Community Land Trust website, sheridanclt.org to find out more about our other Zoom sessions and discovery sessions coming up. Thank you again to Doug. This was a great lesson. I learned a lot. I didn't know anything about caving and now I feel like I have a good start. Maybe not ready to go in yet, but definitely a good start here. And I've posted a link to a survey. If everybody could please take that, it would help me out a lot. It was just about the Zoom session and how it went today. So, all right, I think I'm gonna end the, end the call. Thank you, Alexa. All right, bye-bye everyone. Bye.